The Teacher's Journey takes a deeper look at how we grow, learn, and succeed in the world of education. Throughout the book, you'll follow the journey of seven incredible educators that share their trials and triumphs as they walk along their own journey. The Teacher's Journey will challenge you to reflect on who you are and why you are in education while providing personal examples and practical tools to you right now. Pairing with the book is the Teacher's Journey podcast. There you can hear great educators as they reflect upon their journey and share the lessons they have learned along the way. You can find more information about the book, the podcast, and lots more by visiting costellacorner.com, where you can also sign up for exclusive access to information, graphics, and educational training resources. Edge match. It's edge match. Edge match. It's edge match. You're an edge match. Hey everybody, welcome to Edu Match. Thank you so much for joining us. So uh, tune in with us at podcast with an s.edumatch.org forward slash tweet talk, what you're doing if you hear my voice right now. Um, and speaking of Edumatch, you can sign up to be the featured person of the day. Just go to edumatch.org, look at the sign up button on the top right hand side and click on that, fill in some info about yourself. And we will tweet it out over the course of 24 hours. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. It is a little bit of a wait, a lot of bit of a wait, actually. But uh, in the meantime, if you come up uh, as someone else has similar interest in We'll tag you in it. In addition, you'll be added to the awesome table of edgy matchers. So definitely check that out and, um, and sign up. So today we have an awesome topic about developing high-performing PLCs. So this topic was brought about by Josh. So he's going to be our moderator for tonight. So we're going to, we're going to um, save him for last, but we're going to kick things off with some introductions. So if we could start first with David, if you could please tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, who you are, where you're from, and what you do. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, my name is David Dutrow. I teach at an all-boys private high school in Baltimore, Maryland. I teach English, and I'm currently a student getting his master's in educational technology, looking to improve my school through uh, the use of innovative technology. So thanks for having me tonight. Thank you so much for being here, David, and welcome to Edge Match. So uh, this, is, this is your first time here, hopefully the first of many. All right, great. Next up, we have Tony. All right, so I'm, uh, I'm Tony Catani. I'm the principal of Lenape High School in New Jersey. Uh, I've been there about 10 years at, at Lenape High School as an assistant principal at a, at a school within my district for three years. I'm relatively new to um, social media game within educational purposes of Twitter and Voxer, but it is, I'm loving it. And I've really jumped in the past six to nine months, and uh, here I am today. So just really happy to be here and uh, try to learn from each and every one of you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tony, for joining us and welcome to Tweet and Talks. Uh, also, your first time here, but hopefully, again, the first of many. Now, speaking of somebody with many Tweet and Talks under their belt, then we have a familiar face here with us. So our amazing moderator, Josh, if you could please just introduce yourself and then jump right on into the questions. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm currently a college administrator at the Rutgers University Grad School of Education, a previous teacher, vice principal, principal, and assistant superintendent all in the uh, lovely state of New Jersey. And um, thank you for having me. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart as being an educational consultant over many years. This is one of the areas of my niche in supporting school districts. So um, without further ado, I guess I'll just get into the questions. Thank you, uh, Tony and Dave, for joining us this, e uh, this evening. My first question is, uh, because so many different schools have different definitions uh, for what a, PC, a PLC is. And I just want to get to the heart of it. So uh, what is the difference between the PLC and colleagues meeting together regularly in your uh, point of view? The difference I think is, is having a purpose. Um, I think at my high school, we have a something called common planning time where all of our teachers are, all of our English teachers are off the same period um, every day. And all of our history teachers, all of our math teachers are off the same period every day. And I think when we first started it, um, it was nice. They were able to prep and communicate a little bit, but there wasn't a purpose behind it. Um, in recent year, in the recent year, we, we've developed goals uh, on a monthly, daily, weekly basis. Um, and they're communicating about specific things within their, within their, um, their shared groups. 
of the whys, uh, you know, why, why they do what they do, um, why they're doing, um, what is, why is their goal of the lesson uh, particular to that and specific to that particular class? Um, there's a lot of discussion about that, but I think we had some teachers meeting, but I don't know if it was, if it was productive as it could and should be. And we really started to hone down on some skills of what we wanted our teachers to focus on. And what I've learned is that our teachers have really benefit from, benefited from that um, by um, increasing their collegial conversations uh, rather than just um, just another glorified prep of hanging out together. And I, I think they really sort of benefit and so have our students uh, more recently. And they've become much more productive and it's become much more collegial within our building. I almost think of a PLC sort of like a combination of what I learned in science class and the scientific method and uh, what you see in like uh, PBL with the idea of being like driven by an essential question, but then you go and you actually test things that you discuss together. You see what works. You go back to the drawing board. You you know evaluate your hypothesis and you try something new until you find something that really works. Um, you know PLCs oftentimes have that research component to them. You're going to study a specific book. You're going to study specific data um, and pouring over that one topic to find those gains for students and faculty that Tony suggested. I think really lies at the heart of a good PLC. So I, I just found that. Um, some, sometimes we happen to learn from one another by happenstance, uh, whether it was um, uh, I, I was doing hall duty outside of a teacher's classroom or I was uh, I chaperoned a dance with somebody and started talking about my class and they started giving me some ideas. And I, I think the more collaboration and conversation we can have amongst our teachers it is so beneficial to us. Um, and I think it, that purpose and that direction, that guidance is really needed. I think people really appreciate that and need that um, because I think sometimes the teaching profession becomes an extremely isolated prof profession where it becomes very easy where you can, um, I can close my door and I can have some success, but my success is much different than maybe your success and how you're gauging that and measuring that. And I think sometimes that happens within schools. Uh, they can close their door, do what they need to do, and students get whatever grade that may be and how it's being measured is all different. But the more they're, they're collaborating and they're, and they're conversing about these things, um, I think it's more helpful for each and every one of them for them to grow. So I think it needs to be purposeful and it needs to be somewhat measurable so that all of our staff can grow and help our students better more. Thank you. This, you guys are going really deep and I really appreciate that. Uh, just making the, uh, the chat obviously much more in depth and, and, and purposeful. So we're talking about purpose um, for the chat. But what, what is the ultimate purpose for a PLC? I think that depends on each specific school and where their needs are. Um, you know, you'll hear a lot of people talk about two basic purposes of a PLC, either for faculty to share their expertise with one another or to maximize student aspirations or achievement or gains in that uh, area. But basically, you're just trying to see, uh, fill some void that you see in your own school or individually for a teacher in his or her own life. Um, there's lots of great PLCs that don't have to be confined within your school if you just seek to better your own practice. Um, but in any case, you know, a PLC should take an aggressive step toward making life better for either students, faculty, or both, I feel. You know, when we really started thinking about the PLC and trying to help our staff get better um, was r really thinking about who, what's the variable and who's the common denominator in that classroom. And we felt as though the common denominator was our staff member. And we started thinking about, you know, there's you start, you know, all the talk about achievement gaps and what we can do to get better. We provided a lot of resource to our students, a tons and tons of resources to our students. And we felt as though we were leaving our staff out of how we, we were helping them develop. And we felt as though we could close that achievement gap by giving every student a, you know, a better teacher. And we felt as though the PLCs and the common planning time and the professional development that we provided our staff was going to close that gap so that, you know, you weren't just winning the lottery when you got one, when you received one of the best teachers on your schedule. And, you know, on September one, we wanted all of our teachers to be high performing and uh, differentiating their instruction. And we felt as though by enhancing our professional development, enhancing our, um, our PLC was that we were going to close that gap amongst our teachers of, you know, we, we have a variety of staff members across this country that are do a lot of amazing things and some that are not doing, you know, those same things and, and do it differently. And that's OK. But we needed to you know, share that success and share some of the strategies and philosophies and that why. And uh, we felt as though that was really, really important to cultivate 
each and every one of our teachers. And I feel as a principal, my number one job, you know, as I think Todd Whitaker says, is um, that I have to hire great teachers and I have to make my good teachers great. And if I don't do that, then I'm not going to enhance my building and help my kids the way I can. Uh, so we felt as though it was really important to focus our time in on developing our teachers. We're talking about developing teachers. And sometimes that is, uh, in some cases, because that's something new, an obstacle. And um, can it, it, in some cases, that is the obstacle for, for uh, school leaders. What is the difference? Uh, what is one uh, obstacle your school just has been able to overcome because of operating in PLCs? So one obstacle we were overcome by working in PLCs was that we became, um, we made it much more um, common to be collegial amongst adults. And something that we, we put in place that I think a lot of schools have trouble do doing is one of the things expanding outside of our PLCs and developing those goals and meeting as teachers on a common basis was that we were able to implement peer observations in our building at a high rate of success. And we felt as though, um, you know, the, the best resource that we have, and it's free, is each other, and that we could learn from one another, and that our staff became very comfortable working with one another and learning from one another, and we extended that in from just outside their prep room and into their classrooms, where we uh, we started this program this year, this program this year um, November first, and in a high school my size we have a um, 220 staff, 169 teachers, we have 145 of the 169 involved. We've completed 445 peer observations to date, and they're sharing different strategies strategies and philosophies amongst one another. And that was an obstacle that I think we've started try to do in the past, but really. Developing that culture in our, our PLCs was, was a big deal to move into this, um, this peer observation program, which is expanding our, our repertoire and our, and our structural repertoire in our classrooms every day. I think that was something that we, we did, we built from our PLCs to, to do this and our peer observations. For our school, uh, you know, we've just begun PLCs. We, we aren't what I would call an expert PLC school, but we're, we're working our way there. And my one obstacle that we've started overcoming, I would, I would echo not only Tony, um, but on uh, Twitter, Tay Nicole 0403 just talked about the school culture. Um, and I work in a building that is very isolated from everyone else. In fact, uh, the six teachers that teach on my floor, we call our floor the dungeon because they are cinder lock walls. There are no windows. Um, and basically we rely on each other because we're so isolated from everyone else. Creating and, and joining this PLC at my school though, I really uh, was able to collaborate with faculty and I could feel the trust grow between us. Um, you know, the spirits of all those participating just kind of lifted and the attitude and the culture of school is so important. Um, and even if you struggle to solve real issues at first, whether it's uh, student achievement or faculty performance, whatever it might be, um, making these new strong collegial bonds that Tony mentions is so, so important. And that's going to set the foundation for everything else. And I think that is the one great lesson we learned from beginning a PLC was that we kind of saw each other in a new light. We reminded ourselves we're all here for the same purpose. We're all in this together. And that, you know, support is not as far away as, you know, we might think when we're abandoned in the dungeon without any windows. <laughs> Thank you for learning and growing with EduMatch. Hello, my name is Mandy Freilich, and my book, The Fire Within, is currently available on Amazon. The Fire Within is a book of uh, stories by educators who have gone through personal and professional adversities and who have come through stronger on the other side. They use their superpowers that they gained with their students in order to be better educators. If this sounds like stories of superheroes, you are absolutely right. There's also a chapter on trauma and how it affects the brain and a chapter covering post-traumatic growth and secondary traumatic stress and how it affects educators in their job. So if you are interested in The Fire Within, you can find it right now on Amazon by searching The Fire Within Lessons from Defeat that have ignited a passion for learning. Thank you. You are listening to EduMatch. We're talking about change. Uh, so if your school has or district has high performing PLCs, now the question is, what are the teachers and leaders doing differently now than before you had PLCs? 
I think that what we've all begun doing differently is you know, looking at our common goal and looking at each other as experts that oftentimes in a classroom, a teacher, you know, can, even if they don't revert to that sage on the stage mentality in front of the students, they can oftentimes feel like they have to find all the answers themselves. And that's simply not true. Um, that, you know, PLCs are not afraid to ask the tough questions. They're not afraid to challenge each other. And I think that is the one thing we are doing differently now is that we're pushing each other to be even better educators than we already are. Yeah, I'll, I'll bounce right off that. I think uh, the one word I would say is um, we're sharing more. We have so much collegial conversations right now that we've never had before. And I'm, I'm saying more this year. And I promise you, I mean, we, we've been doing this just for a couple of years. But I, I don't think we were scratching the surface in our first two years, and I think until this year, at, at least at my school. And each department is a little bit different because each department has different dynamics of individuals, right? Um, we have 18 to 20 individuals with a variety of different experience, um, a variety of different perspectives and different instructional strategies and strengths and weaknesses. But I think um, our staff as a whole is beginning to share much more, whether it's why they're doing something, how they're doing something. Um, they're sharing it not just with their own departments, but they're sharing it amongst the entire faculty. Um, we're doing collegiality cafes where during lunch, um, staff are invited to come to hear about a best practice for, we have a 30 minute session and it's a 15 minute like presentation and then a 15 minute share. And we're getting 20 teachers of that. I don't think we could have done that before, 20 teachers at each session. I don't think we could have done that before if we weren't doing our PLCs. And I think that's a, a big component to what our staff you know, is, is committed to and dedicated to, to helping one another. So I, I think that's a piece is that they're leading. And the best part about it is it's not just the usual suspects that have always led a session or been involved, or we are expanding upon and, and making each and every person better. And the thing that we always say is if you're doing average work, then you should feel awkward because there are people going above, above average and going, you know, just doing a lot of great things. So when you're doing average work, it kind of feels awkward within the room of how many people have attended the Collegiate Cafe, have done the peer observations, are sharing in, you know, in their uh, PLCs. And the ones that are not um, are within the minority and they feel a little bit awkward. And we're having conversations, um, you know, quite often about the, all the things that are going on within our building. So I think that's what our people are doing a little bit differently right now. They're sharing and they're taking ownership of it. That is great, especially the collegial cafes. I mean, that's something that I, I my staff, when we did, we uh, had not gotten to that point. And I'm great. Um, thank you, Tony, for saying that different people are leading because that was going to be my question for you. Um, if you're doing it every day, uh, uh, who's leading it? Is, is it you all the time? Is it like a coach? So I love the fact that it's different people leading it. Um, looking to build the capacity of all their peers. Um, and you're just having this um, cadre of staff where everyone is building each other. So that's absolutely excellent. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So today for the last question that we have here for this chat this uh, evening is uh, so, so people are still looking as far as where to start. As Dave stated, this is his building is just beginning this year. You said this is your third year into it and you're finally scratching the surface now more than ever before. And there's some schools that are still looking to uh, get that first step. Like maybe a teacher wants to step out and say, you know what, although it's not happening in my building, I want to be the pioneer in, in de developing its high performing PLCs or just a PLC, just a mindset and to change it, that growth mindset. What resources can you offer to help a teacher, a school or a district leader uh, seeking to develop high performing PLCs or just the beginning of a PLC? I, I think you have to personalize it. I think you need to know your staff and where they are and where you want to go. And I think you need to, I think it's what helped me a lot was, um, you know, piloting small different programs within different departments. My world language department is significantly different than my humanities department and, and the same thing with my English department. Um, we wanted to come up with some school-wide goals, whether it was writing skills. So we started working with our English teachers, because they felt as though it was always falling on them. But then we talked within our history department. We talked to our science department about lab reports. And then we have our English department obviously involved in that. And they started coming together in a talk. So I had my, uh, my, my department coordinators, my department supervisors. We met. Then we brought staff in. Uh, select staff, you know, um, some uh, diverse, whether experience or um, different expertise. And we felt as though we had to personalize it. And we had to personalize it on a daily basis of what their goals are, what they want to get to. And also, you know, 
you, you have to have motivated people that you can inspire with your goal, right? So if they're not intrinsically motivated and you, then you need to try to build that motivation and that, that could be tricky and it's individualized as well. But I think the easy, not the easiest, but the, the thing is you got to think about is how do you personalize it? I don't think what we do at my school will be exact for your school or Dave's school or Sarah. Like, I, I don't think that works that way. I just think it needs to be personalized and giving staff choice, um, giving them their voice and giving them some choice is, is a big component for me, because if I'm telling them what to do, then um, I, I don't think anybody really responds that well unless they're completely vested and, um, you know, and they're empowered by it. When we did the peer observations, I had staff reflect on their greatest strengths and the areas that they were a little bit weaker in, but I had them rank them. And so it wasn't me telling me, telling them what their strength was. It was them identifying their strength and then them um, going out to strengthen their weaknesses. So they identified those things. So they, it wasn't me telling them. And I think that's the best thing is personalizing it and giving them some voice and giving them a little bit of choice as well. Just a couple of things I thought of we could add is Tony mentioned this word earlier and for us just starting out this year. And I think for a lot of PLCs, under, they underestimate the idea of time. You need to find and respect and honor the time that you're going to need to implement an effective PLC. Um, and it's the teacher's sort of greatest enemy time and, and finding people that will spend the time. We have to respect that they're giving up a lot to kind of take part in these uh, planning periods, free time, et cetera. Um, so don't take that lightly. Make sure you give all your participants the time they need to collaborate and, and meet and, and be able to do all these great things together. Um, secondly, don't try to reinvent the wheel. There are so many resources out there online introducing how to begin a PLC, read people's blogs, learn from others' successes and failures, stand on the shoulders of those giants that have come before you, and, and kind of just take it one step at a time. It, this is a process, as we've kind of discussed today. Um, and three years in, like Tony said, he's still scratching the surface. And I think three years in, that's a great place to be. You have people invested. You have people willing to try these things. Um, so just get out there and do it. Don't be overwhelmed by it. A lot of people say, well, I can't start one of these at my school. I'm not an administrator. I'm not a principal. I'm not a team leader. And that's just not true. Um, you know, get out Side your comfort zone, get on Twitter, try some Twitter chats, get on Voxer, find some groups that you can, you know, kind of form a more informal PLN asynchronously at first, and then take that back to your school. See who's interested, who's willing to get on board with you. You're going to find that there's a lot of people out there that have the same mindset as you that have just not wanted to say something because they feel intimidated as well. All it takes is one person to make that first jump and you'll be on your way to something huge. I, I would say um, whoever's starting it or want to organize it, they need to know their why. You know, why are we doing this? Uh, you talk about personalizing it. Why are we having a PLC? Why do you want me to do peer observations? Why, you know, are we talking about what my goal of the lesson is? I think that needs to be shared. And the big thing for us was, you know, a, about closing that, that gap and making sure every student has the same opportunity, you know, with a fantastic teacher. And that we would always say, you know, we always say is, would you be your own child's teacher? Um, or would you want somebody else in this room to be your child's teacher? And if you do, that's sad, right? So we need to make you better. So that was a big push for us was our why. Would you be your own child's teacher? Thank you both for sharing. And, as, uh, and thank you, Tony, especially for like that why. Uh, when uh, in my school, previous school, where uh, I was principal last, uh, we started with just basically three questions, uh, which is all based on DeFore's uh, uh, philosophy of, of PLCs. What do we want students to know? How do we know when they know it? What do we do if they don't or already do? And that drove everything and it's just powerful every single day what do they know how do they know we know it what do they do if they don't so it addressed everyone from you know bilingual special education gifted everything so um again thank you and, it, and having just the varied teachers you said as far as the um different departments having different mindsets and just the capabilities and abilities and even just um the type of students so it, it covered everyone as far as implementing and having us develop the best possible curriculum to address all those uh, very type of learners. And again, I can see just uh, great things are happening in your school, um, both your schools, at just beginning it. And we just appreciate um, you devoting the time uh, today, coming to EduMatch, uh, being part of this panel. Uh, I think I'm taking some of Sarah's uh, pieces. <laughs> um, but I really appreciate you both coming this, uh, this uh, afternoon and um, hope that you can continue to uh, be pioneers and, and change agents in driving this regardless of position uh, for the benefit of students, which is what we are here. 
Absolutely. And I just I just wanted to second everything that Josh said. He said it so beautifully at the end. So thank you, David. Thank you, Tony. And thank you, Josh, for just an amazing conversation. Also wanted to thank everybody who is uh, chiming in with us on Twitter. So some great, great nuggets there. So Taylor, Ashara, Susie, and I saw Susie on the YouTube live. So um, thank you to everyone who was joining us tonight. Also, thank you to everyone who will be listening or watching later. And uh, don't forget to chime in with your thoughts using the EduMatch hashtag. So we have our badging challenges going on. So you can earn up to three badges. So one today is a mild badge. So share three tweets from tonight's episode. They don't need to necessarily have taken place during the episode, even though they can if you want them to. So I saw a lot of you like tweeting that fire. So if you want to use those and just submit them on our badge list. Um, our medium one is a flip grid, so you can just uh, leave a response to any of our questions from tonight's episode. And our spicy challenge, courtesy of Josh, is to uh, share a blog post where you demonstrate evidence of what you have learned from tonight's episode. So you can find all of these challenges if you go to badgelist.com com forward slash edumatch and then you can just click on the hashtag plcs and this will show you all of tonight's badges so you can earn our mild badge um by just clicking on it and then you just join the badge and submit your three tweets and boom there you go you'll get the mild badge there's also medium and the spicy that are also under that category and of course uh dave and tony will be getting our panelist badges for tonight and Josh will be getting the moderator badge. So awesome conversation. So just a few quick announcements. Um, other than that, um, just uh, wanted to remind you all that Dean Ganey's The YNU, as well as Brian Costello's The Teacher's Journey are now available. Um, so you can get those on Amazon, both amazing books. And also uh, new this week, we have launched a pre-order of Mandy Freilich's um, Mandy Freilich's book, The Fire Within. So great book on um, adversity, um, how, you know, how it affects us as teachers and uh, how we can actually use it to our benefit. So check that out. That is also on Amazon. So next week, we're taking off for Memorial Day. Come back the following week. We're going to have a double header. So 6 p.m., we are going to have a virtual free PD, which will be our tweet and talk. So sign up to be on panel, same bad channel, podcast.edumatch.org forward slash sign up. Uh, watch it at podcast.edumatch.org forward slash tweet talk. And at seven, we're going to have uh, Chris Irwin and Jason Wade talking about value added conversations. So definitely hope to see you guys there. Have a wonderful two weeks and thanks again for tuning in. So good night, everybody. If you want to be somebody, if you want to go somewhere, you better wake up and pay attention. It's either now or never to make your dreams come true. You better wake up and pay attention. Hey, everybody, it's Dean from Orlando, Florida, coming to you on Monday, April 2nd, 2018. And I am very excited because today is the official release date of my first solo book titled The Why in You. Journey to the Why in You. I'm very excited that this is available on Amazon in Kindle versions and in paperback. There's your back cover right there. I am so excited because when I think about my journey as an educator, it didn't start yesterday. It started even from an early age. And so this book contains anecdotes, stories about the why in me. And so as you read it, as you pick it up, and I encourage you to do so, I challenge you to consider the why in you, the obstacles, right? That were not always positive. They were not always easy. The journey is never easy, but it is worth it. And there is something positive in every negative if you, if you can just see it. I really do believe that. There is something positive in every obstacle that if you could just see it, it will help you to continue going on that journey as an educator, as an administrator, as a teacher. Um, and so we have a job to do. And, um, and so that journey is so important 
to be embraced. And thank you in advance for checking it out on Amazon. Again, it's the YNU. You can even type my name in on Amazon. It should pop it right up. You can also go to deanganey.com and find it there. Uh, you can click directly on the link and it'll take you to Amazon. Again, thanks in advance for checking it out and have a great day as well as identify the why in you. Mm -hmm.